Aloha kako. Welcome to Anahola Baptist Church with Pastor Kenny Elledge. We are searching the Holy Scriptures today, so get your Bible and ekomomai, join us. God is to be praised. We've just learned already in this doxology for his power and for his eternality, but especially in regards to those attributes as they're related to his plan, that is the gospel. The gospel is applied by the power of God by which we are established or strengthened unto salvation and that includes justification, God's pronouncement of us as righteous, righteous as the judge when we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. That also includes sanctification, the process of our being conformed to the image of Christ now, the, the removal of sin and the taking on of Holy Spirit and induced fruit of righteousness, and in the end, there being no lack in our likeness to Christ in those areas when we are glorified and we are made like the Lord Jesus Christ in our righteousness. The content of the gospel, which essentially is the Lord Jesus Christ, is God's eternal plan. This is what his power in which his eternal uh, plan has been bound up in is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was hidden in eternity. It was hidden until Christ came. There's a very real sense where it was a mystery. But when he has come now, it is made known and even is made known through the scriptures and that of the Old Testament to the nations. And that's really going to be our focus this morning. Is, is now we've seen that God has to be glorified in himself for his power, for his gospel, but what is the purpose for it? What is the purpose for his power? What is the purpose for this gospel that he hid but is now made known? Well, first we see God's design in the gospel, his design or purpose for it, is for the nations. Verse 26. It has now been disclosed, that means revealed, manifested, and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations. And that's the phrase I really want to key in, first of all, this morning, has been made known to all nations. To boil it down, the gospel has been revealed or made known, manifested to the nations. Now, we can't look at this too simplistically this morning. We look at the language and it says, has been made known to all the nations. And if we see in that, that this is something that is just past tense, as if this, this came about when Christ came to the earth and, and now it's done and that was back then, then we'll miss the point that the apostle is teaching us. This is current. What the apostle is saying is God is to be glorified now for something that he's done, which is still ongoing. This message that was revealed or made known for the nations is still that same message today to you and I. And this will continue until Christ returns. This is a perfect message. That is, it's ongoing in the nature of it. The point I want to make clear is it's not a past event. When we read that, we must think of this as God's eternal purpose for the gospel now until Christ comes back. Other translations help us to see that emphasis. The King James, which I think is the best translation of this verse, says this, if I can start from the beginning in verse 26. But now is made manifest, that is what was hidden, is now revealed, the gospel which is hidden is now made known, Christ's coming is made it known, the commandment of the eternal God has been made known, I'm sorry, let me read that again. And by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, and here's where we see that phrase really summarized together, 
made known to all the nations for the obedience of faith. Made known to all the nations for the obedience of faith. This is the revealing of a once and for all time message. Made known not just to a particular segment of the world, which as you go back to the Old Testament, a lot of people see that in the Old Testament, that message was just for the Jewish people. What's really profound with what Paul is saying here, because he said that this regards Scripture. When Christ comes, the Old Testament, he's saying, is made known to the world. The gospel that is contained therein in the Old Testament is made known to the nations. Now, the nations here is the Greek word ethnos. In the Old Testament, it would be goy or goyim. It would be the Gentiles is what he means here. And so what Paul is saying here is profound. And in fact, I wasn't going to do this. It's in my notes. But I think it will help us to understand how profound this is if we go back to Acts chapter 15, the Jerusalem Council. And I want us to see what James says about the Old Testament and the gospel, which is now revealed because Christ has come, and what that means for the Gentiles, and what that means as a result of this message. Who was this message for? You go back and you read, this is one of the arguments about the Old Testament. We don't need the Old Testament because the New Testament is now here, and that's what gives us the understanding of Christ. What Paul is saying, God has to be glorified for his gospel, which was hidden in himself, but is now made manifest and made known to the Gentiles, and that gospel is contained in the Old Testament scriptures. Certainly it's in the New Testament. That's not debated in the church. But listen to what James says and what I'm arguing for that we need to understand about this gospel which was hidden. It's made known in the Old Testament scriptures to the nations. Look at what James says here. He said, let's just start uh, verse 13. James is sort of the leader of the church at Jerusalem. After they finished speaking, James, the brother of Christ, he says this, brothers, listen to me. It's very profound. He takes the leadership role here. Simeon has related, that's Peter, has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take them from a people for his name. Now that comes in Acts, right? We know that happens in Acts. That's New Testament, era, uh, the era of the New Testament. To take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree. This accords to what we've just been going over and Romans, the words of the prophets are speaking to this end that the Gentiles would be included in the promises of God, just as this is written. And now listen to what he recites. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. The tent of David seems to indicate the Jewish people. But I think better understood is God's covenant people. I will rebuild unto myself a covenant people for myself, because the way that James is applying this here is not narrowly speaking to the Jews. He's speaking of this in regards to the Gentiles. I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it. And now he goes on, verse 17, that the remnant of mankind may see, may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old, Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from these things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled from blood. And from, listen to this, for from the ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read in every Sabbath in the synagogue. What he's saying is Moses is speaking to the Gentiles. They know the record of the gospel because they hear Moses. They know the promise to David regards them because they hear the Old Testament. That's what James is saying. Don't bother them with conforming them to the likeness of the Jewish people because God has promised to save the Gentiles in the Jewish scriptures. If you could think about it that way. That's in summary what James is saying there. And Paul is saying this. This is God's purpose in 
his message, which is made known in the Old Testament, and is the gospel, which is manifested in Christ's coming, that you, the Gentiles, would know the living God through that message. Now, we can sit there and we can ho-hum about that and say that's just a historical fact, but you and I are saved because that's true. You sitting there in your seat this morning are saved before, because this is true. This is God's design in that message which he hid in himself in eternity, but manifested in Christ, and that made it known in the Old Testament so that you would be saved. You and I, you see most of us, I think I know most of you, are not Jewish in your ethnicity. So what part do you have in these promises? And Paul is saying God is to be glorified because you have a central role in the plan of God unto salvation. How do we see that in the Old Testament? Where do we see that? Well, first of all, maybe we need to see where we've come from in the message reaching us. Remember what in Acts 1.8 was said, Jesus said, after that the Holy Ghost will come upon you and you shall be witnesses of me. And where did he begin? Jerusalem. And then you go in concentric circles and you say, well, then Judea. And then Samaria. And now the uttermost parts of the world. That's where that, well, what's the message? Where, where did that message have its origin. I think the origin, if we were to go back to Genesis chapter 12, would be very clearly when God says to Abraham, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families or the nations, the goyim of the earth shall be blessed. Now, who does that regard? Some will say, well, that means that as a nation, the United States of America, if we bless the nation of Israel, then we'll be blessed. That is not fundamentally what this verse is teaching. Why do I say that? Because Galatians 3.8 tells us exactly what this means. It means that the gospel was preached to Abraham beforehand, saying, in you all the nations of the earth will be blessed, and that pertains to the Gentiles receiving the promises of Abraham by faith. This is a salvific message, not just a temporal blessing if you bless a nation blessing. This is an eternal blessing. I want us to get that through our heads this morning. God is telling Abraham, through your seed, which we know is Christ, all the nations will be blessed because when they bless your seed, they will be blessing the name of my only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that way, I'm gonna save the world. I'm not gonna just save the Jewish people. They will be saved when they believe on the Son. They believe the promises that I give them. But I'm gonna save those Gentiles who were not a people, and I'm gonna make them a people unto myself because I promised Abraham that I would. You get that this morning? You see, this is God being glorious. A people who were not a people, yes, for thousands of years, 1,500 years from when God gave this revelation to Moses to the New Testament era, that was not something that was clear in the world. But now Christ has come, and the New Testament is telling us all the time, you Gentiles who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ have a place in God's plan from eternity. What do we read in Ephesians chapter 1? What, what was God's purpose in eternity? To unite all things, us included, in Christ. In Christ. I want you to glorify God for his plan to save you in eternity. Gentiles, the nations. We have a pretty good representation of the nations here 
We go to Re Revelation 4 and 5, and we'll see the nation. Revelation is beautiful. You see the nations gathered together there, and they're all worshiping God together in that perfect worship service, and they're all represented. This is God's plan. You look around, and you see who's God is, who God is saving. That's his plan. You want to see how God brings unity out of diversity? It's in the gospel of his son. It's in the lordship of Christ. Why do I say the lordship of Christ? Because the question has to come to us, okay, so it's for the nations, but to what end? For what end? It's for us. The gospel has come, but what does it look like when it comes to us? How will the nations glorify God should be our question. How do you? You should ask because Paul is He's teaching us a doxology. He's, he's not teaching us. He's glorifying God. But how can you be a part of that doxology? Is it just that you say these words? Is it just that we sit there and agree with them? Or maybe you don't agree with me. But, but you still maybe nod your head. And sometimes I say something true, right? But, but is there anything that we're called upon to see that God's design for this gospel comes to fruition. What does it look like? That's the question. Secondly, the nations glorify God when they trust and obey him. Or I could say, trust and obey the gospel. Verse 26 again. We're only going through verse 26. We're not going anywhere else. He says this, here's, here's why the gospel is made known to the nations, to bring about the obedience of faith. This is God's purpose in the gospel for the nations. Now, I believe the truth is pervasive in scripture, but this exact phrase is only found one other time in all of scripture, chapter one, verse five, where the apostles said this of Romans, Chapter 1, 5, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith. So he's saying, this is why I'm an apostle. To this end, to bring about the obedience of the faith, same construction there, for the sake of his name. You see the glory of God bound up there? Now he's saying at the end of the book, God is glorious because this is the end he's bound up for the gospel to bring about the obedience of faith. And then he said there in verse five, for the sake of his name among all the nations. So he's just reiterating the same point he's already made. So we have to ask ourselves this question because this is, this is a good question. What does obedience of faith mean? What does it mean? I was glad to find out as I was studying this that there are at least four possibilities. <laughs> now that helps to narrow it down, right? And, and I'm not going to give you all four in a long uh, recital this morning, but, but one of the views that I held to is that I believe that what Paul w was saying was something like to bring about the obedience of the faith, the faith. In other words, that we would submit ourselves to the gospel. John Murray was right to point out that wherever the gospel is proclaimed, men are called to faith in it. So in that sense, obedience of faith would be obedience in assenting to and believing the gospel. Jesus said in John 6, 28 and 29, he reprimanded the crowd for working for that which perishes. They're following him around the, the, the uh, seaside and the, the hills around the Sea of Galilee, which was hard and arduous. They were working hard, and why? Because they wanted their stomachs filled. That's what we do in this life, isn't it? We want to eat, so we work, and that's a good principle. But Jesus says, you're working for the wrong thing, fundamentally. He says, work for that which does not perish. And then he says this, because they ask him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? 
And he says this in answer. Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. You believe in me, that you believe in me. Now that is worth pursuing, he says. That is worth the effort. And certainly all of that is true. But I'm not convinced this is Paul's point in our text. After all, I think John Stott was right when he said the obedience of faith refers to a faith which itself is obedient and which issues in a life of obedience. I believe Paul refers to what result God has in the gospel coming to the world, namely, faith in the message concerning his son and obedience that comports with that faith. Now, if we see that obedience is just an identical virtue to faith here, then it's all just one thing. The obedience of faith is just something that the end terminates in believing, and that's how we obey, we believe. I don't think that's what the apostle means to say. The wording matters here. Paul says the language is very clear. The obedience of faith, there is no article. There is no the. It's obedience of faith. And it means that faith in the gospel, listen to this, produces obedience. This is God's purpose in the gospel. How should the nations, how will the nations glorify God? By believing the gospel and obeying God. Obedience is begotten by true faith. Indeed, Paul says in Galatians 5, we work through faith. Love works through faith. Faith is what is necessary for us to love at this time. How can you love if you don't believe? And it also is what is necessary for us to obey. And so that's what Paul is saying. He's saying faith is what leads to obedience of life. The Greek scholar Robertson renders this phrase, the obedience which springs from faith. Now we are very quick and rightly so to recognize in Romans the centrality of faith. But we don't often also see the centrality of obedience in Romans. You know that of all the times that this Hebrew or Greek word is used in the New Testament for obedience, it's only found, this particular Greek word is only found in the epistles of Paul, or only found in the epistles, the letters to the churches, which I think is profound. Because all of the letters, if you, if you read, if you follow the letters, it's usually this. Here's what the gospel is, believe it, and here's what the Christian life is, do it. Look for that pattern. Obey God, fruits of the Spirit, so on, Colossians, what we read today. It's almost in every single epistle. But that word for obedience, of all the times it's found in the New Testament, half of them are found in this book, Romans. Half of them are found here. Of note, consider that Paul in Romans has taught that eternity for all of humanity rests on obedience. You hear that? Eternity for all of humanity rests on, obe rests on obedience. Where does he say that? Chapter 5. Verse 19, so that by one man's obedience, first, first, let me say this, the first man was Adam, and the key feature of him was, for as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. And he says, because of that, all are guilty because of his disobedience. Well, that seems pretty important, doesn't it? Sin has fallen up, out upon the human race because of Adam's disobedience. But what about the other end? In the same verse, so by the one man's obedience, who's that man? 
Jesus, the second Adam or the last Adam. For by one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. And the last verse says, leading to eternal life. So the late Dr. R.C. Sproul was correct when he says, fundamentally, every one of us are saved by works. Now you're getting uncomfortable. You should feel uncomfortable. But you see, it's Christ's work. Without his perfect obedience, there's no salvation for us. Does obedience matter? Do you, when you hear a preacher call you to obey God, what kind of shivers come down your spine? Convictional ones that say, God help me to obey you. Or does the shivers, of, oh, I don't like this. I'm saved by grace. You know, don't give me ought to do. Don't tell me I need to do something. What have we seen? Grace and obedience comport with one another. They agree. You see, this is part of the good news in the New Testament. When Paul says in Romans 6, 16, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. He knows that at the end of the verse, he says, for the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But he still says, you must be slaves to Christ and to righteousness. Why? Because grace in you compels you to. What do you think faith does? What is, it? What is faith? What is faith? It's not just assenting to a set of facts. What is it about Christ that attracts you to him? Just what he gives you? Or who he is? The Son of God. When you see him as the righteous savior, do you delight in his righteousness? Do you love him for the fact that he fulfilled the law in all points and he did not fail in one of them? Do you love him for his holiness? We, all, we sing about Jesus' love plenty times. Do you know that if Jesus is not love in that way, he is not a savior? Do you admire him for that? Do you love him for that? If you do, you have faith in him. And what the scriptures are clear to say is that faith produces in us a desire to be like him in that love, in that holiness, in that obedience to the Father. He says over and over again, I come doing the will of the Father. And now we see that it is God's purpose in the gospel that we obey God. We are in union with Christ by faith. We've died with him and we are raised together with him. Eden, Lehua, your baptism demonstrates that tr that's true of you. That we are no longer ourselves. We've been bought with the price. Therefore glorify God in your body, which is Christ, which is, it belongs to him. That means live your life as a pattern of obedience so that by that pattern, men will see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's the gospel purpose for us. Now we are bound to fail of obedience. Oftentimes we will, but this is where the encouragement that we see, the discouragement, but then the encouragement of the scriptures and the gospel come through to us. And we've seen it in this book. Romans 7, 18, for I know that nothing good dwells in me, says the apostle, that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right. That's faith, faith gives us that desire, but not the ability that is in myself to carry it out. But we're not left without ability, we're not left without power, we've already glorified God for that in the doxology. Verse 24, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that doesn't just mean that I will be saved because I will be forgiven for my disobedience. It means I will be saved unto obedience. Because that's where he goes into chapter 8. And he doesn't end until he gets to glorification. 
which is that finally we are made in the image of Christ. The remnants of our sin is burned or lost. It's gone at that point, and we are like him in righteousness. Now, this same truth of faith leads to obedience is found everywhere in Scripture, but I want to bring us to Hebrews 11.8. Think of this. Uh, you don't have to turn there, but think of this with me. Abraham, who is the figure for faith and justifying faith, this is what the author says about him. By faith, by faith, by faith, you have to have true faith for this to be genuine obedience. Without faith, no one can please God. But listen to this. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called out to go to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. Now listen to this. We don't often think about this, but if God would have told Abraham, Abraham, I've got promises for you, here they are. I'm gonna give you this entire space of land for your seed and your, uh, uh, the seed that will follow after you. I'm gonna give them all of this land. Here's the borders of it, there you go. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go throughout the land. Don't settle down, don't make a concrete foundation. You're gonna be a nomad going throughout this land. I want you to see what I promised you. Here you go, and, and Abraham says, oh, I believe you, I ain't going nowhere. <laughs> Thanks for the promises, I'm, I'm happy to receive them from you, but pff, that's great, I'm happy where I am. You think Abraham would be the depiction of faith that we have if that's what he did? Why, how would we know Abraham believed anything if that's what his response was? And yet that's all too often how we think of salvation. You are saved by grace. God bestowed that promise on Abraham without any conditions for Abraham to receive them in his own righteousness. God promised him those things. Abraham believed it and that belief, was, belief that faith was demonstrated in works in obedience. That's exactly what James teaches. James 2.17. So also by faith itself, it, if it does not have works, it's dead. But meaning your faith is dead. You don't have true faith. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. And he says, show me your faith apart from your works. I will show you my faith by my works. And that's exactly what we see in Abraham. That's why he is both a picture of faith and obedience. Because this is what the gospel brings. This is what that gospel that was preached beforehand brings. The heart that agrees with the psalmist which says, I delight in your law, O God. I delight to do thy will. Isn't that what Jesus delighted with? That speaks about Jesus. Now, do you delight in what Jesus delights in? And if you can't say yes, then you probably don't believe in him. Do you believe in him? You don't compartmentalize Jesus. I've said it many times. You take him as he has been revealed. He is the gospel. The whole of him. Knowing him is knowing God the Father. Knowing him is having eternal life. And that leads to obedience. Good works agrees with the grace of God. Good works, let's, let me say this, agrees with the grace of God. Now grace is unmerited favor. That means what we're talking about with obedience does not gain you salvation with God. It doesn't gain you favor with him. It doesn't gain you eternal life. It doesn't merit you anything. You don't, you don't add to anything that Jesus lacks when you obey God. But grace agrees with this necessity of obedience with the necessity of obedience for those who believe. Titus 2, 11 through 14. I want you to go there because we see it all here. We see redemption. We see the pattern of the Christian life. We see grace, which is what we receive that we do not merit from God, the good that we receive that we do not merit, even our salvation. All of these things are here. Titus 2, 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared, manifested, disclosed, revealed. You see this? 
theme in, in the New Testament, bringing salvation for all people, the nations there, have it in your mind. Training, training, grace trains. What's it train us to do? To renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this pre present age. It trains us unto obedience, beloved. It trains us. Grace trains us. Waiting for our blessed hope. The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Glory be to our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Who gave himself up for us. Or sorry, let me read that. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all. What does he do? He redeems us from all lawlessness. And I think that all lawlessness means that's the transition, transaction. Our unrighteousness is upon him. He redeems us from our sins. He forgives us our trespasses. That's not the end of his redemptive work. And to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Obedience. Obedience. You know what you don't hear enough of in the modern day churches? A call for God's people to be holy. We be love all we want to be and we'll not define it at all. But love comes under the umbrella of holiness. Meaning, it's not all there is. The fruits of the Spirit are love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and patience and kindness and on and on. And now we see that there's things that we can't pursue. Things we have to put off, right? That's obedience, beloved. Now, here's the final point. Two observations to close here. First, God has saved us for the end that we be obedient to him. Is that desirable to you? One way you'll know that's desirable to you is that when you sin against him, you are not comfortable with it. No matter who tells you in your ear it's okay, embrace that in you. Someone who has true faith in the Lord Jesus Christ knows that to sin against God is not what Christ would, what would please Christ. It's not what Christ did. It's not what our Lord did. It's not what God would be pleased with. That matters to the one who believes. Obedience is the end to which we are being saved. What do I mean by that? I mean what Paul said in Romans 8, 29, what he summarized there. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. That means in eternity, he foreloved you to be what he says next. To be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might, might be the firstborn among many brother, brothers. In other words, God has ordained that your obedience be what marks you in eternity in your likeness to Christ. How do you esteem obedience now? Because the point that I want to make is, if you don't think obedience is important now, you will not like heaven. You won't like living every day in perfect obedience to God. But a Christian delights in that. A Christian delights in that. What, do you, what, do you, what delights you more than to glorify God? with the conduct of your life. I mean, the heart working out in the deeds of the body. That's what Paul is lamenting is that that's not right yet. That's not perfect yet. What does he want? Complete victory. Where does it come? Through the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is coming. It's coming to us. Because this is part of what God has bound up his glory in. Listen to this. God has bound up his glory in your obedience to him. He will do it. Is that encouraging to you? 
If you are in Christ, he will finish this work in you. And that's the second point. Again, we have to go back to by whose strength, by whose power does this come about? It's by God's power. It's by his strength. This future hope is realized us by faith in Christ, and this produces obedience in us now, but it is because of the love of God and the grace of God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. Jude one twenty four. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory. Philippians 2.12-16 through 16, Therefore my beloved as you always have obeyed so now not only in my presence but also more in my absence work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's obedience. That's holiness without which no one will see God. Hebrews says in chapter 12. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. So let us give God the glory then by the exercise of true faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel which God has given concerning his son, which he lived in perfect, perfect righteousness while he was on the earth. He died a substitutionary death for our sins and he rose again for our life to be hidden him so that we will be like him one day perfectly when we see him as he is. But may the grace of God produce that fruit in us now, the fruit of obedience, so that men will see our good works and what? Glorify our Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is in heaven. Let's pray. Our Father.